Good morning, church. The scripture reading this morning can be found in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. John 14, 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. are going to be looking at John 14, 1 through 6. It's a passage that has always intrigued me, um, and so I want to talk about, about this. Uh, and in mind, I read from the NIV primarily, and so oftentimes you'll find a little bit different wording in there, and this is one of those cases. But it, it's a, a passage that I often think about. In mine, it says, do not let your hearts be troubled. In mine, it says, trust in God, trust also in me. That's kind of what I want to talk about today is the idea of trust and what that means. How do we live a life as Christians of trusting in God? What does that look like? And what do we trust him for? We're going to talk about that. As I was studying for this lesson, I ran across a man who told the story that he was, he was taking flying lessons, trying to become a pilot. And so his instructor had taken him way up in the airplane, and the instructor then put the plane into a deep dive and then killed the engine. And, they, and then he didn't say anything. He let the guy that he's training, you know, this guy's trying to learn how to be a pilot, he says, he basically said, he said, what do I do? And the instructor was just silent. And the guy had to figure, he panicked for just a half a second, you know, trying, what do I do? You know, this is a, this is a bad situation. And finally he got his wits about him and said, okay, I remember what the instructor told me. And he says, okay, and he got the plane back on and he took it out of there. And he says, then after he got done, he was rather mad at the instructor for doing all this. And the instructor says, listen, there isn't a single position you can put this plane in that I can't get you out of. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. And so from that on, time the, the um, pupil did trust him. And that's the idea, too, in life. We can't get ourselves into any position in life that God can't get us out of. We trust him. And, and we tend to do that in ourselves. I and mean, we get ourselves in all sorts of trouble. Sometimes purposely, you know, we go out of our way to try and do things our parents don't want us to do or against the will of our, maybe our employers, you know, but other times we just, uh, no fault of our own, we find ourselves in trouble. Things aren't going right. They're not going the way we want them to. And what do we do about it? And all too often, we go turn to ourselves, say, well, how am I going to fix this? And how am I going to get myself out of this difficulty? And we want to trust in ourselves instead of trusting in God. And that's what I want to talk to us about today, is trying to remind ourselves that we ought to trust in God for everything. Because he can take care of everything. We can't, there's no situation we can possibly get ourselves in he can't take care of. You know, it, it doesn't matter. But we need to learn to trust him. But what is this idea of trust? In, in the uh, version from which uh, Bryant let, read this morning, it says believe. And that really is kind of the best translation there. It's a word that we use for believe. And we often tr translate these words as believe or to have faith. But it also sometimes is translated the idea of to trust. But there's another Greek word that we often use that is translated as trust that oftentimes you'll find it translated as to have confidence or to be convinced. It's the idea that we have something we can rely on. It's a sure thing. I'm confident that it's true. I believe that it's true and I can rely upon it. I can trust it in everything. I remember years ago, and maybe some of you remember this, that John Justin used to tell a story about an African tribe that was trying to translate the Bible into their dialect. And they got to this word trust, and they couldn't quite figure out, they didn't really have a good word in their dialect to try and translate this. And after many hours of discussion, they finally came up with, well, it means to put your whole weight on it. That's the idea. I can trust it. I can put my whole weight here and know it's going to hold me up. And some of you have probably heard me tell the story about my days working out in the woods as a forester. And I would go out there, and we'd have places where we had, we had thinned the trees. 
And so you had these different small young trees laying on the ground, kind of scattered and piled up. And sometimes I'd have to go and walk on top of them. And a lot of times I'd go out there and I'd kind of go like this, you know, kind of half-stepping. I don't know if I can trust it to hold my weight, you know. But the idea of trust is I can put my whole weight on it and know that it's going to hold me. And over time, I could learn to recognize which trees would hold me up and which ones would not. So I could put my whole weight on it. And that's the idea of trust, that you can have full assurance, full confidence in it. There's no doubting that these things are true, and I can depend upon them each and every time. And that's the idea of trust. And so then Christ comes in here in chapter 14. He's just told his disciples that he's getting ready to go away. If we back up into John chapter 13, verse 33, he's my, he says, My children, I'll be with you only a little longer. You'll look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. And then he gives a new command, you know, love one another just as I have loved you. And Peter says, now wait a minute, Lord, I hear all this stuff about love, but wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, where are you going? You know, what's going on? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Well, Peter, well, Lord, how can we can't follow you now? Why can't we follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus says, I, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. We're familiar with that. But you can kind of see what's going through the disciples' minds here. Jesus says, I'm going away, and you can't follow now, but you come later. And they're saying, what is going on? And Jesus is giving all these last-minute instructions. They're trying to take note of all this. And so Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't worry about these things. And I think that's one of the things in our lives too often is we get ourselves in trouble or trouble finds us and our hearts are troubled. And we begin to worry and we didn't have anxiety. We try and we're fretting over these things. What can I do? And Jesus says, don't worry about it. Don't let this concern you. He says, you trust in God. You believe in God. Believe also in me, he says. So I want to talk about this idea first about trusting in God and then trusting in Christ for just a few moments. You know, why do we believe God? Why should we trust God? There's a lot of people today, unfortunately more and more people, who don't trust God. They don't believe he even exists. Or if he does, he doesn't care about our situation. And he's not involved in any way. He's just kind of letting the world go any way he wants. He doesn't take care of it. He says, why does God allow suffering to go on? Why does God do all this? I can't trust him. He doesn't seem to answer me. He doesn't seem to do the things I want him to do. Well, that's part of the problem. Uh, we want him to do what, what we want him to do and not what he needs to do. Um, but we can trust God. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18, we're told there that Jesus or that God cannot lie. It's just not part of his character, right? Where he says, um, talking about his promise to Abraham here in this passage, that he promised Abraham he'd have many descend descendants, and in order to make sure that that promise was true, he took an oath. And in verse 18, then it says, God did this so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. And there's that idea of, of trust right there, is that God cannot lie, so when he promises something, we can depend upon it, and our hope is based on that. Not based on ourselves and what we want, but what God has promised. And it, then it goes on to say, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. God can't lie. It's just not part of his nature, his character. And I'm sure all of us, have, at one point or another, have found ourselves lying. And we've run into people who lie. And when people lie, you can't depend upon them. You can't trust them. We had a conversation just this morning about the idea of trust and being able to trust one another. Trust is something that's built over time. It's part of our relationship. And it takes sometimes time to build that trust and to recognize, yes, I can have confidence. Just like I'm out in the woods, it takes me time to kind of recognize what trees I can stand on, which ones I cannot. But I build that trust and I can know. Same thing in our relationship. Same thing with God. Over time, from the creation of the world until today, he has never once failed in his word. Never once. How many of us can say that in our lives? That we've never once failed on a promise or failed on what we said we were going to do. We can't do it. We're not perfect. But God is. And that's what I can trust in. I can depend upon that. Rely upon it. 
And in Titus chapter 1, Paul reminds us of this as well. Chapter 1 of Titus, in the first three verses, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at its appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Since before time, God had made this promise, and he carried it all the way through time and made it come to pass that Christ would come and die for our sin. And everything that needed to occur, occurred. Because God promised it, and he can't lie. He can, we can trust him for all things. There's nothing that he doesn't make come true that he's promised. And to me, this is actually one of the strongest proofs that the Bible is the word of God. And it's not just something made up by men. Because you go through the Old Testament, and you read about all these prophecies that are made in there. And some of those prophecies are so specific, it's impossible that they could come true unless they were come from God. Particularly, say, the book of Daniel. In fact, some scholars don't want to even claim that Daniel was written when it was because the prophecies are so specific, there's no way. I mean, they're predicting 100, 150 years ahead of exactly who's going to be king and how many kingdoms there's going to be. And we can't predict who the next president's going to be, let alone who's going to be president 100 years from now. You know, but God can. You know, he knows these things, so trust it. It is fully worth trusting. And, and I, I, you know, I could go to the Bible for many, many examples of people who have trusted in God, and they've learned a lesson from that. But I want to go to a, a passage in Jeremiah that is probably far less well-known that perhaps illustrates this from the reverse side. And in the book of Jeremiah, who is known the, as the weeping prophet, he's forever telling the word of God to people, and they're forever not listening to him. Um, he writes in Jeremiah chapter 7, I just want to read a couple pass uh, verses here to start with, that Jeremiah was one of these people who trust in God. Excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. It says, But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Probably a lot of you can understand why I like that passage because it talks about trees, and I like to deal with trees. My whole career has been about that. Now I teach about trees. And one of the things we're actually teaching about right now is we're looking at forest health and protection of what kind of things cause disease and whatnot. One of the biggest things we're seeing out there today is, is drought. Uh, drought puts trees in stress, and they can't survive other stresses. And here, Jeremiah talks about the idea that when we trust in God, when we put our full confidence and reliance in God, we're like a tree that's planted by a stream that never dries up. We've always got water. We always have a source of strength to survive and to get through things. And that's what we need to be. And that's what Jeremiah was in his day, a person that trusted God no matter what. And things didn't always go well for Jeremiah. They went terribly wrong at different places. But in our story later on in Jeremiah, um, Jeremiah... Babylonian has now finally come in and captured Jerusalem, just as Jeremiah predicted was going to occur. It finally happened. And Jeremiah has actually been set free by the king and told, you can live wherever you want. And so Jeremiah is living in the land. And the king of Babylonia has a, a put a man in charge of the people who are left there. Uh, the king's already taken a whole bunch of people off to Babylonia, but some people are left, and he's put a man in charge. And unfortunately, some of the Jews were there, apparently didn't like this. So one of them rose up and actually killed this man who was in charge. And uh, so the people who were left after this, and they thought that he was a, an, an ally of the Jews, and it turned out he was kind of against them. So the Jews are kind of, they're struggling now. Uh, they're here they are in this land. They've, been, uh, the, they've got somebody overseeing the land. The person put in charge has now been assassinated. And they're saying, well, now what do we do? And so they decide they're going to run to Egypt. They think, well, Egypt's a nice, strong, powerful land. We can go down there. We'll be safe. We'll be protected. And so they know that Jeremiah is a prophet. So the leaders and the people, I'm in Jeremiah chapter 42 and 43, chapter 42 in particular. So they come to Jeremiah in chapter 42. Then all the army officers, including Johan, son of Korea, and, and Jezaniah, son of uh, Hoshana, 
And all the people from the least to greatest approached Jeremiah the prophet and said to him, Please hear our petition and pray to the Lord your God for this entire remnant. For as you now see, though we are once a might, many, we're only a few left. Pray that the Lord our God will tell us where we should go and what we should do. Now, when they come to Jeremiah, they're already figuring out, we need to get to Egypt because it's not safe for us anymore here. Because the king of Babylon is going to hear about what's happened. He's going to blame us, and he's going to wipe us out. We need to get out of Dodge. But they come to Jeremiah and says, okay, Jeremiah, tell us what the Lord says to do. Jeremiah says, I've heard you. I will certainly pray the Lord your God as you've requested. I'll tell you everything the Lord says, and we'll keep nothing back from you. And they said to Jeremiah, may the Lord be true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with everything the Lord your God sends us to tell us. Whether it's favorable or unfavorable, we'll obey the Lord our God to whom you're sending us so that we, it'll go well with us. We will obey the Lord your God. Now that sounds like a good, good outcome, right? A good attitude. We want to hear the word of the Lord. And I don't care what it is, we're going to obey the word of the Lord because we know we can trust the Lord, right? That's what they're saying to Jeremiah. Okay, Now, Jeremiah, 10 days later, the word comes to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah goes back and he tells the people. Now, what do you suppose they told the people? I, I sometimes love, I think the Lord's got a sense of humor at times, because the Lord already knows, they already have in mind, they want to go down to Egypt. But what the Lord tells them, we drop down there, <coughs> verse 10. If you stay in the land, I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you, for I am grieved over the disaster I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you and will save you and will deliver you from his hand. I will show compassion on you so that he will have compassion on you and restore you to the land. Wow. So he tells them to stay put. To stay where you're at. I'm going to take care of you. Sounds like a good plan, easy plan, right? I don't have to go to Egypt, pick up everything. But do the people listen? They said they're going to listen. But he says, if you will not stay in the land and disobey, then uh, no, if you go and live in Egypt, um, you're going to see, and you're trying to get away from the war, war is going to follow you. You're trying to get away from famine, famine is going to follow you. You're trying to get away from disease, disease is going to follow you. Don't go to Egypt. If you do, this is what's going to happen. So Jeremiah tells them the word. All right. Verse 40, chapter 43, verse 1. When Jeremiah finished telling the people all the words of the Lord their God, everything the Lord had sent to tell them, Azariah, son of Hoshea, and Johanan, son of Kerea, and all the arrogant men said to Jeremiah, You're lying. The Lord our God has not sent you to say you must not go to Egypt and settle there. <laughs> what a turnaround. They say they want to hear the word of the Lord. They know that Jeremiah is a prophet. They know that the Lord can do all these things. And yet when they get the word of the Lord, they choose to disobey it. And so they do. They go down to Egypt, and all the disasters trying to avoid comes upon them. You're better off to follow the word of the Lord. And that's our problem sometimes today. We say we want to follow the word of the Lord, but do we actually do it? Do we follow through with it? Do we listen to it? Because sometimes, like that, it seems totally contrary to everything we want to do and totally contrary to what makes sense. Jeremiah, you're telling us to stay put. We've just killed the leader that Babylon sent in charge. We've just killed him. And you're telling he's going to take care of us? This doesn't make sense. But that was the word of the Lord. And had they stayed put, they would have been just fine. And so the same message is for us today. Do we listen to the word of God? Do we follow it? Do we obey it? Do we believe it? It's one thing to say you believe something. But another thing is to follow through with your actions. And that's why I like the word trust so much more. Because... Belief can imply something. I can believe in something, but I may not have any action associated with it. But trust, if I'm going to trust those sticks, I say, I believe those sticks are going to hold me, but if I don't actually put my weight on it, I'm not really following through. Some of you teens and maybe young people remember having a trust fall. You know, you stand here like this, and they have somebody behind you you're supposed to fall over backwards, and trust they're going to catch you. That's putting that belief into action. I can stand here like this and believe they're going to catch me, but if I don't actually fall and let them catch me, I've not really trusted them. And that's the idea with us. We need to put our lives in God's hand. Trust him. He'll take care of us, no matter what. What I see happening in the world so often today is that people are trusting everything else but God. You know, because they don't believe in God. They're trusting in things like their money, trusting in Wall Street. 
Many of you probably have read about the history of the, um, back in 1929, the great crash. And people lost their fortunes because they had it all invested in money. And fortunes were gone. And people literally were jumping out of buildings, killing themselves because they trusted in that money. And it was gone. And today, people do the same thing. We tend to want to trust in our money. We want to trust in our ability to take care of ourselves. And this lesson, like so many I preach, are ones directed at myself because i got to think about that as well. Am I trusting God with my money? Am I trusting God with my life and everything associated with it? Or am I trying to build up myself first, then I'll take care of God's stuff? You know, when I, when I make my bu- monthly budget out, the very first thing in the top of my budget line is my, what are the, the Lord? Not the bottom, the top very first. God wants the first. He wants the best. Am I trusting him? He's going to take care of me the rest of the month if I give him out of the first part of my paycheck. That's what he told the people to do in the Old Testament. What around the table this morning, or the um, collection that Mike was talking about in Malachi, he says, he said the word that was used there was to test me, try me. It's the same idea. Trust me, God says. I'll take care of you. You know, do what I say. But too often, people want to trust in their own money, their own abilities. Or they want to trust the government to take care of them. If I get myself in trouble, the government will bail me out. You know? And too often we do that. We trust in other things and other people. We trust so often in ourselves that we can make it right. We can figure these out. Sometimes we can't. But we know that God is there to take care of us. And so he makes us the promises that he'll always be with us no matter what. And that's why Jesus goes on then to talk about the fact, tr- you trust in God, now trust in me. Jesus says there in, in, back in John chapter 14 then, where he says, I am going, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to, to, with me that you may be with me where I am. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Jesus is telling him, yes, I'm going away, but I'm going to my Father's house. He's basically going to heaven and making a place ready for his disciples. He says, if I'm going to do that, you can trust me. I will come back for you. And you can be with me as well. It's a promise not for them, but just for, for well, it's for us as well. That we trust him, trust Christ for our salvation, not in ourselves. And that's one of the issues that too many people have. We trust in ourselves for our own salvation. We trust in ourselves for everything. But we need to trust in God first and foremost. Trust in Christ. He's the only one that can save us. And Christ here is trying to tell his disciples, you can trust me. Fully, completely. In everything. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm coming back for you. A promise that's repeated over and over again that he is coming back. We haven't seen him yet. But I trust that that promise is true because every other promise God's ever made is true. This one's true as well. I can rely upon it. So I give my life to Christ for that reason. His disi- I mean, he even shows a little bit of confidence in his disciples there when Jesus says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. He's got some confidence in the disciples. But then Thomas, the one we always kind of talk about doubting, doubting Thomas, Thomas speaks up and says, wait a minute, Lord. We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? You know, you, you told us, Christ, you're going away, but, but where are you going? Where's this place? How can we know the place, how to get there, if you don't tell us where it's at? And again, they're thinking, as they often, so often do, and sometimes we do, they're thinking more physically. Thinking, okay, so is he going to Egypt? Is he going to Samaria? Where is he going physically? So we can know the way and find the way, but Jesus, as he often is doing, he's talking more spiritually. You remember the time when Jesus told the, the disciples, says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees? They began arguing among themselves because they forgot to bring bread, thinking they were talking about bread, physical bread, yeast. And Jesus went on to say, no, you, you've missed the point. I can feed thousands of people with just a little bit. It's not bread. It's a teaching. And it's the same thing here. They've missed the point. It's spiritually he's talking about. That the way, and that's why then Jesus comes up there in verse 6 of, of John 14. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's a profound truth, a profound statement. A one that people today struggle with, just as people of Jeremiah's day did, and said, this doesn't make sense. How can this be true? There's only one way to get to God. There is no other way. People out there today want to say, well, there's many ways to God. Find your own way type thing. And Jesus declares, there's only one way. Only one way. And it's through me. There is no other way. It's because of our sins that we have failed God, that we've not lived up to his standards, and we can't get back there without Christ. And so without putting our dependence in Christ, we can't be, get there. 
but Christ is the way back to the Father. He is the way to eternal life. He is the truth. He's speaking truth, a profound truth. C.S. Lewis is, is credited uh, most often with saying that the, either the statement, either he is a, um, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Now, there have been other people that have said something very similar before, but he made it most succinct. And the idea that when Jesus makes this statement, he's either a complete liar, that th this is not the truth, or he's got to be out of his mind. He believes it's true, but it really isn't true. He's just out of his mind. Or he's got to be Lord. And it's up to you to decide. Just like the people of Jeremiah's day, they got to decide, are you going to believe God or are you going to believe man? Are you going to believe yourself? Trust in God. Trust in Christ. Because he is the only way that we can reach eternal life. He has given us everything we need. It's strongly worded. But it's meant to be, because he came to save and to seek the lost, every single one of us. And we see this in the apostles. When they lived out their life then, they continued on in the apostle, in the teaching of Christ, and they put their complete confidence and trust in Christ. They're going so far as to speak before the, the uh, Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and say, we've got to trust God, or we've got to follow God, not you. Even though they were beaten, stricken. And Paul even going out and being stoned for preaching Christ and getting back up and going back into the city again, facing all those trials and tribulations because he trusted Christ for his salvation. And we need to do the same in every aspect of our life. You know, that no matter what kind of trouble we get in, and oftentimes we do find ourselves in trouble, we're in monetary trouble or we're in emotional trouble or whatever, and we say, what do I do? Trust God. In, Phili in Philippians chapter 4, verse about 6 and following, Pastor, you've probably heard many times, but it, it carries this same idea of trust in God where he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's a command in there. You know, don't be troubled. Just like Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Here it says, don't be anxious about anything. But instead, present your request to God. That's what we, part of what we come around here to do is to present our request to God. What's on our hearts? What's on our mind? What do we need help dealing with? Present them to God. Don't worry about them. And a promise is there that he will guard our hearts and minds in all things. You know, it may not give the exact answer we want, but we know that God's with us. He'll take care of us. Trust him. Give him an opportunity to help you through every single situation. Because... We can't always trust ourselves. We can't always trust our friends or our family. We can't always trust the government. We can't always trust the money. It, things come and go, but God is there forever. And so put your full trust, your full weight on him in everything. We can't, as, as Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, that we, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We must come to him believing that he is, and he's a reward of those who earnestly seek him. And that's what I believe you are here today, that you are people who earnestly seek God's way. You believe in Christ and we need to do that. And that's what Jesus said. I am the truth, the way, the life. And we confess him before men that we believe these things. We're letting others know that we in fact believe these. And in Romans chapter 10, um, we often go to verse 10, but I want to look at 10 and 11. Where it says, for with your heart you believe and are justified and with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, verse 11, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. You know, our confession is an act of trust in God, that we believe, we have confidence that he is Lord, is what we're saying. We believe that with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and it leads to our salvation. And we follow that up because we believe that he is Christ, we believe that he's our salvation, we believe that he's the way to, to eternal life. We turn from our way of trying to justify ourselves and trying to fix everything ourselves and depending upon ourselves, and instead we depend upon God, we depend upon his way, his desires. What does he want done? And this is exactly what Christ did, that he came here confessing that he was, showing that he was the son of man, but he was the son of God. But he trusted in God in everything. There's a statement there in Matthew chapter 27, verse 43, when he's hanging on the cross. And the people there were saying, well, he trusts in God. Let God come and save him. There was something about Christ's life that indicated that people saw that he trusted in God. 
It was the fact he was willing to go and talk about God and the fact that he lived for God. Everything he did was to please God. There's a couple of passages in John chapter 8 and John chapter 12. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm not here speaking on my own. I'm not doing what I want. I'm doing what my Father wants. He sent me. I'm doing his will. Everything I do is for him. That ought to be our way. When we repent and turn, everything we do is for him. We're showing we depend upon him. We trust him. So he knows what's that. It's what Christ did. And in, um, back in um, 1 Peter chapter 3, um, last week, <coughs> Mark was speaking from this, actually chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, speaking about Christ and his example, verse 21 and following. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So Christ could have retaliated, could have reached out. That would be our normal reaction. But instead, he entrusted himself to God. That's the kind of life that we live. We entrust everything to God, no matter how things are going. And we let him take care of it. And so when we repent, we're saying, okay, I'm going to let you have your way, Lord. We trust ourselves to him. And then trusting in his finished work, what he has done for us, we submit ourselves to him in baptism. That we give our lives to him and let him wash away our sin. We trust him. We place, or putting our confidence in him that he will save us, not in ourselves. It's one of the things that I think that some people, perhaps somewhat uh, rightly so, can't accused at times of putting too much emphasis on baptism as a work. Because I've heard Christians at times, not often, but sometimes they'll say, so why are you saved? I'm saved because I was baptized. We're, we're using it in a sense of saying, okay, Lord, I was baptized. You commanded me to baptize, so I was baptized. Now you have to save me. We're using it in a sense. Our mindset is saying, just like the Pharisees used to say, Lord, I followed all your commands. Now you have to save me. And we can do that with baptism if we're not careful. We're putting our trust in our being baptized, being washed, putting in the water, instead of being trusting in what God is doing in baptism. That's the whole point. That our mindset is, Lord, I can't save myself. I trust that you can. I'm, I'm submitting to your will, and I'm allowing you to wash away my sins and make me new, because I can't do it. That our salvation begins and ends with him, and we're simply committing to his way. And so that's what we do in baptism. It's, it's putting our trust in him to save us in everything. And that's what I'm asking you to do today is to put your full trust in him for your eternal life, your eternal soul, which is much more valuable than this life here on this earth. This is going to go away at some point in time. But eternity is forever. Christ says, you trust in God. Trust in me. I am the way, the truth, and the life that can save you. So trust me in everything, for everything. I want to close with a couple passages here, one from Titus and one from 2 Thessalonians. In Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, uh, oh, Titus chapter 2, 4 through 8, okay. Okay, let's go to Second Thess. I'm sorry, I've, I awful. I must have written something down incorrectly in my notes. Second Thessalonians three one through five. All right. But I know there's a passage there in Titus that I want to read. But it says, finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence. There's that trust. That's that reliance. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Prayer is one of those aspects that we need in our lives. Paul asked for prayers on several occasions, this being one of them. Pray that he would go out and speak boldly. Yeah, and we need the prayers of one another. It's one of the reasons we come together, so we can encourage and build up one another and pray for one another that we may indeed carry out the work he's called us to do because we know it's difficult, but he has given us what he, we need to accomplish his will. We can depend upon it. We can trust it. And I wish I could find where I was at in, in Titus um, because he, he mentions there 
about the idea that we are uh, to continue to do what is good, trusting in the Lord at all times. You know? And that's my message for you today. Trust God. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of any situation you're in. Because he's promised that he will. And he's always kept his promises. So he can't guarantee that I can keep my promise every day. I try, but I'm not perfect. But God is. So where is you? Where is your trust? Is it in God or is it in yourself? Put your trust in God. If there's anybody here that's struggling with things in their life and how to trust God and where to go with it, we're here to help. So if you need to have your sins washed away in baptism or you've got some other struggles in your life as a Christian, let it be known as we stand.